Okay. Well, how would we figure out these magnitudes? Um, just on a tree. So yeah, like what? Um, for a ten at the y, um, we do the sine of fifty nine point five. Okay. All right. I think you know how to do that, so we don't have to work that out uh, math mathematically. By the way, you can also do this without using this angle. You might have seen how to do that on the other video. Maybe I didn't do that on the other video. Yeah. Um, there's actually a better way that doesn't require this angle. Okay. Um, let's imagine we didn't even know the angle. We can just use the fact that these are similar triangles. Okay. That's actually a lot better. That would work better if these were variables rather than numbers. If these are variables rather than numbers. Um, so how do we set this up if these are special triangles? Well, we set up a ratio. So their proportions would be equal as well. That's right. So. For example, we could do the ratio of f sub y to 0.0075. Well, what corresponds to f sub y in this triangle? Yeah. And then we just do algebra to solve. And that would give us this number here. And you could do something similar to find this. I think in that other video series, I did focus on using the angles. That was a mistake, though, because that doesn't work so well for algebraic problems. Yeah. For algebraic problems, it's better to use the similar triangles technique. I did it that way because that was more similar to what you did last semester. But it's actually better to learn the new method here. Um, all right, so when you're breaking these vectors into components, it's best to use the similar triangles technique. So anytime you're working with the electric force in two dimensions, you should make two separate triangles, a se apart from your main picture, a distance triangle and a force triangle. And because they're similar, you can work back and forth between them. All right, and we can do the same thing to find f sub x. Now, here, here's a, a good thing to notice here. How, how would we indicate the direction of these components? Well, we can indicate the direction of the components with their signs. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that for an overall vector. Overall vectors don't have signs. Because after all, um, if a component is parallel to the axis, it's positive. And if a component is anti-parallel to the axis, it's negative. But the overall vector is neither parallel nor anti-parallel to an axis. So there's no clear way to assign it a sign. So there's a whole different way to find the direction here, which is to specify this angle. And that, I think, tends to confuse people. Yeah. Because there are different ways to specify directions for different types of vectors. The way to specify a direction for a vector component is with a positive or a negative sign, based on whether it's parallel or anti-parallel to the axis. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't work for an overall vector. The way to specify the direction of an overall vector is by figuring out the angle that it makes. So I'm not going to put any sign here. Of course, another way to specify the direction of anything is in words, but that's not as useful for solving mathematical problems. You could just say this is up, and this is left, and this is northwest, but those are not as useful. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. When you use the triangle method, you've got to put arrows on the force triangle so that you can figure out the signs down here. But no arrows here, because this is all magnitudes. Mm -hmm. Now, that actually gives us a whole new way to describe what, this, uh, what the, uh, the force is here. Another way to describe a force is just to give the components. And that is oftentimes a good way um, to do that. You know, I'll actually calculate these answers here. So 0 0.0075 times the sine. about 0.006, and this would be, point oh oh three eight. Actually, when you do your homework, they're generally not going to ask you for answers in this form. They're going to ask you for answers that are broken down into components. And they're going to ask you to express that in terms of x hat and y hat. So for example, in this case, we would express this as the force is negative 0.0038 x hat plus 0.0064 y hat. And you'll be able to tell when that's what they want, because you know they always say, what variables to use in expressing your answer. So if they tell you to express the answer in terms of x hat and y hat, mm -hmm. then you know that this is the kind of thing they want. That's actually most of the, how they would do the problems here. So that's another good way to express a force. You can express a force either by giving the overall magnitude and its angle, or by giving its components. Mm -hmm. And the way mastering physics asks you to give components is like this. Notice that this is a single answer just added together. Um, 
all, or you might use i hat and j hat for some of the problems. Mm -hmm. i hat is basically the same as x hat, and j hat is the same as y hat, mm -hmm. and k hat is the same as z hat, if you would see those. So um, now we've seen how to break the electric force into components by using the similar triangles. And again, we've seen that you don't need to use r hat to figure out any of the signs or directions. OK, good. So what's Coulomb's law for? Coulomb's law is for finding this side. It's for finding the hypotenuse of the force triangle. And one thing that I think that was clear to you is what do you plug in for r? You plug in this hypotenuse. You don't just plug in the horizontal or the vertical distance. You plug in the overall distance because Coulomb's law gives you the overall force. Coulomb's law does not directly give you the x and the y components. You have to figure that out separately later using the, special, using the similar triangles. Mm -hmm. Well, let's discuss how we would find the net force on charge 2 here. Good. It's good that you're labeling that. F of 1 on 2 would look like that. Good. And to save time, we won't work this out on paper. We'll just kind of describe it in words. I think you might have seen something similar to this in the video. So, so let's just describe in words how we would do this. Okay, so I would just basically use Coulomb's law twice. Right, great. Just with the R distance between each of them. Good. And with the different Good. point forces. And then? And then add them together. Okay, Based good. Based on their direction, the direction that I That's seeing. the key. That's the main thing I wanted to make sure you were going to say. Good. So in fact, what would have been even better is, why did you even bother writing these directions to get the signs? So we should have just written the signs right away. So what should be the sign for this force? Uh, how about this? And how about for this one? Make. So it really is a good idea, as soon as you find the direction, to write down the sign. Because that was the whole reason we wrote down the direction anyway. And if we wait, what usually happens is, if people, once people find the magnitude, they're so pleased with themselves that they just declare victory and stop. So it's important to actually write down this, the sign at the beginning. The most, one of the most common mistakes here is forgetting to put in the negative signs when things are negative. So we just want to get in the habit of doing that up front. OK. Uh, obviously, if we don't put in the right sign, we're certainly not taking into account the key aspects of the problem, because there's a huge difference between whether the force is to the right or to the left. So that's something that's very important to notice. Okay, and then we could use Coulomb's law separately to figure out these two separate forces and then just add them up. Um, and you would add them. You are adding them. It's just that one of the numbers you're adding will have a negative sign. Sometimes people say, oh, I should subtract because this is negative. Well, that's more confusing than it's worth. It's better just to say that you add up all the forces. Some of the forces will be positive and some will be negative. 
And then, since you've gotten the signs right, the math will tell you whether the net force is in the positive or the negative direction. It'll come out directly. And one more time again, we, can, we see we don't need to worry about our hat to, to get the directions right. There's a much simpler way to approach this. Good. And by the way, what you were basically assuming there is that the net force is just the sum of the individual forces. And fortunately, that is the way it works. That's what's called the superposition principle. The superposition principle is that to find the net force, you just superimpose all the individual forces. So the fact that charge 3 is exerting a force on charge 2 does not change the force of charge 1 on charge 2. You can figure them separately and then just add them up, which is good because that makes the problem much simpler. Okay, good. So the most important thing to emphasize here, one important thing to emphasize is make sure that you're focusing on the force on the right charge. We would do things very differently if we were finding the force on this charge, say, or on this charge, and do the signs first so we don't forget about them.